Um, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Gjuma Abusse. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome, uh, welcome Yuri Zhukov, um, assistant professor of political science at the University of Michigan, our very own, um, who will be giving the talk today. His work focuses on resettlements, counterinsurgency campaigns, and the dynamics of violent conflict um, in areas as different as the Northern Caucasus, modern Ukraine, and Cold War Russia. His fantastic research has been recognized with several awards, including one for his dissertation, which is entitled A Theory of Indiscriminate Violence, and for the brilliant way in which it combines deep knowledge, extensive archival work, and cutting-edge methodology. Um, and so it's with great pleasure today that we welcome him to the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, as he will give his talk entitled Trading Hard Hats for Helmets, The Economics of Rebellion in East Ukraine. Welcome. Thanks, Anna. All right, so, uh, so thank you all for coming out. I'm glad that we could uh, take advantage of this lull in fighting uh, to take stock of what's happened so far. I believe we have about two weeks before uh, a renewed offensive. Um, before you know, uh, you know, we have to wait until the spring melt is done until you can actually drive track vehicles on the roads. Um, so this is a project that I began uh, about a year ago before. Uh, uh, this turned into what most of us would recognize as a full-blown uh, armed conflict. Um, and it's evolved into, on the one hand, a data collection project in which uh, we attempt to collect event data on this conflict in almost real time. Um, so this is only one part of a much, much broader endeavor. Um, and it's also the first time that I'm publicly showing these data to you. Well, everything here is very preliminary. I need to state that caveat up front. Um, so I also welcome any comments you have at any point on any aspect of this project. Um, we're right now at a very good stage to take uh, any kind of uh, corrective uh, feedback. Now, um, and before I begin, I also want to acknowledge uh, support that I received from the center and uh, from uh, the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, which has enabled me to bring on board a fantastic team of research assistants uh, listed here with, without whose help this project would not have been possible. Um, and um, so the motivation behind, uh, behind this project, behind this particular paper, uh, is what I saw as a, well, general dissatisfaction with the state of the public debate uh, around uh, the general political crisis in, in Ukraine and also the conflict in the Donbass in particular. And what you often see in the Western media, in uh, the think tank community in D.C., and also in academic settings such as this, is almost a kind of a monocausal explanation for the, behind the conflict. And it's essentially this, the Putin effect, that Putin is responsible for, um, first of all, for forcing uh, Yanukovych to abandon the EU association agreement in November of 2013, thereby sparking the protest that would lead to his ouster. Um, Putin was responsible certainly for annexing Crimea, for uh, sparking and then financing and maintaining the uh, armed uprising in the Donbass. And I'm not going to challenge any of that necessarily. Uh, it's, uh, I believe this is unmistakably a case of Russian aggression. Uh, and, um, and without the singular role of Putin, probably, uh, First of all, this conflict would not have reached the stage that it has and probably would have been resolved a lot sooner. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that this is a hybrid war. Um, on the one hand, it's an interstate war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, in which Russia denies involvement. On the other hand, it's a, it's a civil conflict between Ukraine and its own citizens, in which Ukraine refuses to acknowledge as a civil war. Um, but by keeping the focus on Putin and on the role of Russian aggression, uh, well, on the one hand, we're denying agency to a lot of local actors uh, who have been instrumental in uh, explaining this local variation in the fighting. So I think uh, Putin is a certainly a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the violence, and in particular, it does not explain local variation in conflict intensity. Um, certainly does not explain why the, the level of violence would be much higher in village A relative to village B, why one village will be much more susceptible to uh, Russian propaganda or much more receptive to, uh, uh, to uh, Russian incursions and, 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 to, and to Russian uh, foreign fighters than another village. And so essentially what I'm trying to uncover is what I'm trying to explain is this local variation from village to village, from week to week. Um, and I'm going to focus here on two, uh, two theoretical stories that have received uh, some press of late. One of, the, one of them probably more than the other. So the first is ethnic nationalism. Um, this idea that Donbass, Donetsk, and, and Luhansk are home to a significant Russian minority. Um, 
uh, which has been whipped into a nationalist frenzy by Russian propaganda, by the so-called Russian Spring, by Crimea's uh, annexation by Russia. Um, and essentially that we should expect much more violence in places where these Russian speakers, where these ethnic Russians live. Um, on the other hand, there's a, there's a second story here, one of economic shocks. The Donbass, uh, the, where the conflict is, is currently occurring, is essentially been the industrial heartland, not only of Ukraine, but of the Soviet Union. And it's uniquely vulnerable, uh, both to changes in the terms of trade and to various uh, negative economic shocks that resulted from, uh, <coughs> from the start of war between Russia and, uh, and the EU. Um, and a result of which, patterns of local economic dependence on Russia should be far more predictive of conflict than, uh, than the ethnic, local ethnic balance. And I hope to convince you that the second of these has a bit more predictive power. Um, now, just to give you an overview of what these arguments are, if you've been following this conflict over the last year and a half, you've probably seen a lot of maps like this um, in the Washington Post, on CNN. And essentially what this tells you is that um, this whole region of southeast Ukraine is home to a significant uh, share of uh, Russian speakers, and that we should expect uh, this, this part of the country to favor closer ties to Russia, while West and Central Ukraine should favor closer ties to the EU. Um, and these arguments range from kind of the primordialist extreme, where uh, you hear talking heads on CNN talking about apparently deep cultural cleavages between Russians and Ukrainians. Um, that for some reason would outweigh the deep cultural ties that exist between these two peoples. Uh, but I don't think uh, too many serious scholars would, uh, would take that argument at face value. Uh, probably a more sophisticated argument that you sometimes hear is a collective action story. This idea that um, shared language facilitates uh, the industrial organization of a rebellion it en enables uh, rebels to identify spies, uh, defectors within their own ranks, um, and, um, and there's been broad empirical support for this in other settings. I think it's much more problematic to apply this to the Ukrainian case. If for no other reason, then this language that they have, these pro-Russian rebels, is not, they don't have a monopoly on it. They also share it with the people that they're fighting this war against. The language of command in, in many of the armed units on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, is Russian. The language of command in the ultra-nationalist Azov Battalion, you know, um, that are characterized as neo-Nazis in the, in the Russian press and also in the Western press, is Russian. Uh, the Ministry of the Interior's Facebook page is in Russian. The Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, Asenyi Yatsenyuk, who's characterized in the, in the Russian media as an ardent Ukrainian nationalist, speak Russian at home, um, ardent Ukrainian nationalist. Um, and so, um, so it's not really clear how how this argument applies, uh, but then there's one that's received a little bit more uh, uh, more credence is this argument about ethnic exclusion, about apparently discriminatory language policies, which uh, the new Ukrainian government tried to adopt after uh, ousting Yunukovych in, uh, in February of last year. Um, this bill, by, by the way, did not become law. Um, in many ways, it's, this threat has been um, exaggerated. Uh, extensively by the by the Russian press and also by the Western press, um, and um, whatever discrimination there is against Russian speakers, um, I mean there's a huge disconnect I think between perceptions and realities on the ground. Um, but out of these three, I think the third one is probably the one that um, probably the most plausible of, on this of this menu. Um, on the economic front, um, well actually, first of all, the main prediction of the ethnicity and language school is that. We should expect more violence in areas inhabited by Russian speakers, by ethnic Russians. We should expect these areas, uh, not just on the province level, but on the village level, to experience, uh, experience greater levels of rebel activity, to, be, uh, to experience them sooner, to stay under rebel control longer. Um, and, um, and so we'll test that prediction. We'll see if that holds. Um, now, the economic story. Um, emerges from a, from, from a long tradition of uh, political economic literature on civil conflict, uh, which emphasizes the role of negative economic shocks. Uh, there's Charles Tilley's uh, classic work on food riots in Europe. Uh, there's been a lot of work on uh, the effect of uh, negative growth shocks and, uh, and shocks to the terms of trade. And, uh, and the general story here is that um, uh, essentially within Ukraine, d due to the um, uh, 
EU association agreement, there are going to be several industries, several whole sectors of the economy that will be disproportionately disadvantaged uh, by the new terms of trade, uh, which I'll, I'll walk you through in a minute. Um, and um, as a result of which, many people are going to lose their jobs. The opportunity cost of fighting is going to go down, and there will be more soldiering. Um, and uh, this is basically a story of a region that is um, highly vulnerable to these kinds of disruptions, much more so than any other part of Ukraine. Um, so we'll see to, the, to what extent does, uh, does this logic hold. Um, and, so, and the main driving force be behind these negative economic shocks within Ukraine has been, on the one hand, um, well, change in the, term of tr in the terms of trade due to the uh, EU association agreement, but also uh, considered a Russian policy of imp import substitution. Um, high trade barriers that they have put up in retaliation for, the, for this EU association agreement. Uh, also, IMF loans have uh, certain conditions attached to them, one of which is to end government subsidies to whole entire sectors of the economy, uh, to cut back on, uh, on the social spending programs, and, uh, and to um, raise utility prices, basically across the board austerity, which for many reasons affects this region more than others. Um, then there's another story, which is um, a story of looting, a story of raiding. Um, there are hundreds of illegal coal mines in this, in this region that sell uh, their, their, uh, <coughs> their production on the black market. Um, these coal mines are also a great place to find explosives. Um, and then new stories of late have been full of reports of rebels uh, uh, well, essentially extorting uh, local citizens, uh, uh, kicking uh, uh, people out of their apartments, kicking entire organizations out of their factories and, uh, and uh, Protestants out of their churches. Um, and so there are plenty of financial incentives for, to, accru to uh, attract a different kind of recruit, um, one who will be attracted by, uh, basically by the appeal of plunder. Now, the main prediction of this, uh, of, the, of this narrative is that we should expect more violence in areas potentially harmed by trade openness with the EU, trade barriers with Russia. Um, I do not currently have an identification strategy that will allow me to distinguish between these, these three sets of mechanisms that, that I've outlined. But what I will do instead is try to look at the face validity of these, different, of these two different comparing and uh, contrasting uh, narratives of conflict. Now, brief background. Um, the, um, so the current crisis began in, uh, in November of 2013 when uh, President Yanukovych uh, did not sign uh, an EU association agreement which would have given Ukraine uh, well, preferential access to, U to European markets in exchange for, uh, for Ukraine implementing a series of economic judicial reforms and, uh, and raising their production standards up to what is commonly accepted in Europe. Um, and almost immediately, uh, mass protests erupted in the heart of Kiev uh, and Independence Square, and they gained the name Euromaidan, Maidan meaning square. Um, and um, the, initially, these protests uh, were almost exclusively peaceful. Um, their demands were for essentially the government to reconsider their choice, to go ahead and sign a disagreement with the EU. Uh, calls for Yanukovych to resign were relatively rare at this stage. Um, but then about a week later, uh, the Berkut riot police tried to disperse these protests by force. Um, it did not work. Um, the protesters changed tactics. They started erecting barricades. Um, and they started uh, adopting more extreme tactics. Um, civil disobedience, property destruction, tearing down Lenin statues, replacing them with a nationalist uh, uh, Ukrainian insurgent army flag, um, which uh, is seen by many people in the east of Ukraine as uh, a hate symbol. Um, now, during this time, there were also counter-protests throughout the east and south of Ukraine. This one is uh, from Crimea in December 2013, several months before the annexation. You know, they're still flying Ukrainian flags at this stage, and they have signs that say, Stop Maidan, um, which uh, it did not stop. It escalated. Um, and in February, um, as the protests became increasingly more violent, uh, dozens of, uh, of protesters Protesters were killed by snipers in, uh, in the in this independent square, about a dozen riot police as well, um, until eventually on the 20, uh, 22nd of February, Yanukovych fled, um, fearing for his own safety. Um, and 
police had abandoned their posts in the streets of Kyiv. Um, and the people providing for law and order and security were these Maidan self-defense forces, kind of the security uh, units from uh, uh, that were, were part of the protest movement. Um, now, essentially the next day, uh, protests in the east and south of the country escalated. Uh, there was a counter-protest between pro-Ukrainian Crimean Tatars and uh, I guess what you would call pro-Russian, pro-secessionist uh, Crimeans. Um, of course, in Crimea, these protesters also received uh, support of uh, these little green men, which we later found out were Russian special forces. Um, you know, and they were, by all accounts, very polite, uh, silent, but polite. Um, yeah, they didn't speak much. Um, and then eventually, uh, with their help, Crimea held a referendum on independence. So they had tried to do this before, uh, in 1994. Um, and so this is... These pro-independent sentiments are not a new thing in that part of the country. Uh, this time they were successful. Um, and then there was an effort, essentially, to replicate uh, this experiment in other parts of, uh, of Ukraine, in, uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, where originally it seemed like protesters were adopting the same tactics that were uh, used earlier by, uh, yes, uh, pro-Euromaidan protesters in the west of the country, basically occupying government buildings and, 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 and police stations. Uh, but then uh, we, had, we, had, we got the sense that there was something qualitatively different about, uh, about these protests. And part of it is that they were more, much more heavily armed. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and they apparently had a large contingent uh, that was either not from the region or, um, or otherwise was very reluctant to tell uh, locals who, uh, or, or journalists who they were. Um, it has not ended well. In fact, the result has been much worse than probably anyone I had anticipated at the time. Um, and, um, and just a quick uh, overview of, of the protests. Uh, I mean, they originally, this is both pro and, and anti Euromaidan. The epicenter of the protests had originally been in Kiev uh, and all throughout the west of the country, then eventually it moved uh, and migrated to Crimea after the you know, total disaster, and then to Donetsk, Luhansk, Kharkiv, uh, Zaporozhye. <coughs> Uh, Odessa, Nikolaev, uh, Kherson, actually, I mean, all throughout the southeast uh, of the country. Um, but really, only in Donetsk and Luhansk did this become a full blown war. Um, and that's where the protest story ends and the war story begins. Um, and I, sh I should add that I mean, these regional differences had always existed within Ukraine, uh, particularly differences over their uh, foreign policy and trade preferences. Um, now, uh, this, is a, this is a poll run by the Rosenkopf Center in, in, in Kiev. Uh, I mean, support for joining NATO has never been a majority position throughout Ukraine. The only place where it really approached even 40% was in the western parts of the country, uh, been in the teens and almost in single digits uh, in the south and east. Uh, perhaps even more striking is economic preferences. Uh, this, uh, this survey asked, how do you compare Ukraine's standard of living to Russia's. Um, nowhere in the country did a majority of respondents say that Ukraine's standard of living was better than Russia. Um, even in you know, the pro-EU, uh, apparently nationalist West, uh, not even the West did a majority say that conditions were the same. Um, and if you look at the East and South, strong majorities say that it's much, much grass is much greener on the Russian side. And indeed, pensions are higher. Uh, GDP per capita is higher. Uh, and if there is one advantage to having a president for life is that it, it entails some economic stability that every time, every time there's a new president of Ukraine, property gets expropriated, factories get shut down, there are wage uh, uh, delays in, in paying wages, and there's a lot more insecurity, uh, financial and, and uh, job insecurity, that, that comes with living in Ukraine. Uh, where the political situation is much more chaotic. Um, but if this is the case, right, uh, if the South and East really do feel this way, why has the conflict not spread more broadly? You know, why didn't it spread all the way to Odessa, all the way to previous Soviet, as many pundits predict predicted at the time? Why is it isolated to well, a few regions, a few, few uh, districts, rayons, within, uh, within these two provinces? So let's take a deeper look at the Donbass. Well, known by, by many as being uh, home to the former president, Yanukovych, who was the former governor 
of uh, Donetsk. Um, and, there, and his vote share, if you look at the previous, uh, the, uh, the, m the most recent presidential election in, in 2010, you know, hovers around like, like 90, 93 um, percent. Strong support for him, but also more broadly, this is the most populous region of Ukraine. These two, uh, these two uh, provinces combined have six, uh, about six and a half million people, about 15 percent of Ukraine's population. So for Ukraine to lose these regions would be kind of the same as if the U.S. were to lose Michigan and California, right? It's a giant chunk of the population, giant chunk of the labor force. Um, I mean, the Russian population there is significant, but it's not overwhelming. Um, a much higher proportion of the local population is Russian-speaking rather than ethnic Russian. Only about 40 percent of ethnic Ukrainians speak Ukrainian at home. Um, Russian is the dominant language, um, privately and publicly. Um, um, but it's also uh, not a poor region. It's a, it accounts for about a sixth of uh, Ukraine's GDP, second only to Kiev. Um, it's the most heavily industrialized part of Ukraine, um, accounting for 27.3% of its industrial production and 80% of what they produce, they export. They count, they're, regionally, they're, they count for the largest share of Ukraine's exports, about 23%. Uh, their number one trading partner is Russia. And I should note that about 25 years ago, this would not have been an export market. You know, these are things that they produce domestically for, uh, for heavy industry within the Soviet Union. And then in the 1990s, uh, you know, their, their main customers became well, basically within a foreign country. Um, they didn't change much in terms of what they produce uh, or how they produced it, who they sold it to. Uh, what changed was now there was a border between them and their customers. Um, and this region has always had a long history of labor activism. There have been a series of general strikes every couple of years. There was one in a, and every, every time this happened, it almost completely grinds the local economy and the Ukrainian economy to a halt. Um, there was a general strike in 1989, general strike in uh, 91, 93, 96, 98, 2002, 2011. Um, each time the demands of, uh, of, of uh, the industrial workers that were striking, which are not just coal miners, also steel workers and uh, machine builders, um, there's a lot of logical consistency in their demands. They want, on the one hand, um, more subsidies from the, from the, from the federal government uh, or from the central government in Kiev. Meanwhile, they also want financial independence. Uh, on the one hand, they wanted uh, access, more access to markets. Uh, on the other, they wanted government institute a series of protectionist measures to basically shield them from foreign competition. Um, and, um, but the core, of, uh, the core of their demands uh, <coughs> on a more big picture level is essentially the same one that emerged last spring. Um, a long forgotten referendum in 1994 that was recognized as legitimate by Kiev. Uh, the, uh, the residents of Donetsk and Luhansk voted on, uh, on three questions. Regional autonomy, Russian language rights, and economic union with Russia. Basically the same issues that were on the ballot last May. Each of these, within both uh, provinces, received between 80 and 90 percent support. So these are not new demands. Uh, now, let me give you a sense of um, just the, the structure of the trade between uh, Ukraine and these, uh, these two trading partners, the EU and Russia. So uh, to Russia, Ukraine exports heavy machinery, uh, metals, agricultural products, you know, food. Uh, from Russia, they import oil, gas. That's the bulk of it. Um, now, to the EU, they export metals, agricultural products. From the EU, they import heavy machinery and consumer goods. Now, now you already you can see kind of a conflict here. Uh, now, the... Um, and let's, let's, so let's break it down by industry. Let's look at what, e what each of these, uh, what the big industries in, uh, in the Donbass produce uh, and what it looks like. So um, probably the most successful, the most dominant industry in the region is steel. Um, um, probably the bulk of it is owned by this man right here, Leonat Akhmetov. I would add, by the way, that Donetsk is home to, uh, or was home, to three out of the top five Ukrainian companies by market cap. Uh, that, and by that I mean one, two, and three. All three of them are owned by this man. Um, the, um, 
And the metal industry accounts for 50% of uh, the industrial output in the, in the Donbass. Uh, and, and it's actually quite successful. It, they export to 50 different countries. Uh, it's highly profitable, competitive, um, and in a very good position to replace uh, losses, uh, the loss of the Russian market with, a, with other potential customers. Um, that is not the case in the coal industry. The coal industry is heavily subsidized, really inefficient. A large chunk of the coal mines uh, did not produce anything especially the state-owned coal mines. Uh, essentially, they have a labor force uh, that's paid uh, to keep the mines running, keep the mines operational, prevent them from flooding, prevent them, prevent them from exploding. But they don't produce any coal. Um, the ones that do uh, are actually only dependent on Russia in indirectly. So they, about 12% of their coal they export to Russia. Uh, about a third of it they export, to, well, they actually uh, sell to factories that are highly dependent on Russian orders. Um, but the main threat to their livelihood uh, is that uh, they're on the chopping block. Um, Kiev sees this as a dying industry. Um, IMF loans require the end of these subsidies. They require the mines that are still working and, and profitable to be auctioned off, and, uh, and mines that are not to be closed down. Um, and this is a set of, set of uh, I guess, a, a brigade of miners from the uh, Trudovskaya Shakta, marching under the, the DNR banner. Um, now, probably the biggest threat here is to the machine building industry. Um, so, Ukrainian machine building, almost half of it is concentrated in the Donbass. Um, they produce mainly, you know, uh, capital goods, locomotives, mining equipment, steel furnaces, rolling mills, and the like. 60% um, of what they produce, they export to Russia. Um, and this is particularly true for locomotives. Uh, their entire company town, like Luhansk itself, is basically a company town organized around one giant factory that produces locomotives and locomotive engines and wagons with one customer. Erzhede, uh, or the, uh, the Russian uh, <coughs> railroad uh, company. Now, there's essentially no domestic demand. For, uh, for most of what they produce. I mean, some, some industrial cranes uh, s th that can be used in ports, they might sell to Mariupol. Some of these, uh, some of these steel, steel furnaces, they might sell to the steel plants, but this is not equipment that, gets, uh, that needs to be swapped out for, for, uh, for new ones very frequently, uh, essentially like once every 10 years or so. Um, this is also not competitive uh, in the EU, not competitive in Asia. Um, Especially the locomotives. I mean, they run on the Russian rail gauge. Uh, no one else wants them. Um, it's uh, it's also pretty expensive, um, and um, and Ukrainian machine building is pretty. Uh, I mean, EU machine building is pretty uh, well developed. And so, in a sense, they're by far the most vulnerable to the EU deal. They're also the most vulnerable to the Russian trade war and these uh, this new import substitution uh, plan that uh, Russia has put into force. Uh, so, for the, so. It's, and this actually started before the current crisis, around 2012. Uh, Russia started substituting a lot of the machines that they imported from, from Ukraine with domestic production in the Urals. This started, first of all, in the, in the uh, arms industry. Um, basically, this is an attempt by Russia to gain larger market share in the arms trade business. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of what this region produces, Russia can produce domestically much cheaper. Um, and so, in a sense, dumb I mean, Donbass is much more reliant on Russia here than, than the other <coughs> way around. Um, and so, um, that, uh, when you read economic analyses of, of the EU deal uh, by economists, what the, what the general story that they tell is, uh, well, uh, overall, uh, the EU deal will be, will be a good deal for Ukraine as long as, uh, you know, we gain access to European markets and as long as trade with Russia and the CIS does not decline precipitously. Um, pretty much any, every sector of the economy is going to be fine in the long run. Oh, yeah, but then there's a the machine builders guy. Yeah, those guys are screwed. Uh, but everyone else will be fine. Um, so um, this is a potential problem spot. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about the data that we've been collecting in order to actually see how much that actually matters. Um, and so um, what we've been doing is uh, basically a multiple source event data collection project uh, where we draw on Ukrainian, Russian, Rebel sources, also international media reports, um, and so uh, so we've been basically scraping uh, 
event reports uh, from various news agencies in near real time. Um, this is basically the di geographic distribution as of, kind of uh, mid-February. Uh, so these include Ukrainian Channel 5, which is owned by the president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko. Um, and there's a uh, Espresso TV, which has sympathies to uh, the party of the prime minister, uh, Sergei Yatsenyuk. And then there's also um, the, the official Facebook page of the ATO, uh, the industry, Ministry of the Interior's uh, uh, Facebook page, uh, the, where they give uh, incident reports on what's happening in the war zone. Um, there's pro rebel bloggers, uh, Rusvesna.su, they actually kept the old Soviet Union um, uh, web, uh, web suffix. Um, uh, Sprotiv, which is uh, basically run by Dmitry Timchuk. Uh, um, basically a pro-Ukrainian military blogger, uh, I believe now is also deputy of parliament, and then there's uh, Ukrainian news wire service, and also Wikipedia, why not, throw that in there. Um, then there's also OSCE, um, which uh, produces uh, daily updates on the conflict. Um, and, um, and so we scraped down all of these. Um, and then um, for the locations, uh, basically I run an automated geocoding script where uh, that extracts place names from within sentences, matches them against a database of about 3,000 populated places in, in the Donbass, according to the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, and then cross-validate uh, cross the coding uh, after it's done uh, to take care of the uh, inevitable errors that may exist. Um, but then to figure out what these events actually are, rely on automated text analysis. Uh, so. Uh, my, my re research team and I, what we do is we uh, take uh, we take a random sample of reports, I mean, between uh, 300 and 500 I in each of these. Uh, depending on who's coding them, uh, it will be either in the native Ukrainian or Russian or, or uh, translated into English. Um, and, uh, and then uh, within, each, within each of these data sets, we code up that trading set, uh, that which we then use to train uh, supervised machine learning algorithm. Uh, in this case, I used a support vector machine for the kind of beta version of the data uh, to then uh, kind of predict what these events are uh, for a set of event reports that it has not seen before. So, so, so essentially, this allows us to, uh, well, uh, to categorize, classify these events as they come in. Uh, so as new event reports are released, uh, the algorithm uh, looks at um, similar events uh, structurally uh, in terms of text that have been published before. And basically that has a predictive model that assigns, assigns them to whether it's a rebel attack, whether it's a government attack, um, uh, what kind of tactic is being used, uh, whether it's artillery shelling, whether there are casualties involved. Uh, there's a host of different parameters that we code. Um, and just to give you a sense of some of the challenges in, in, in coding these data, um, there's a lot of reporting bias. Um, so this is a... This is Ukrainian event reports. Uh, I believe this one's from uh, Channel 5 or Petri Ukrainsky. Uh, uh, now, um, so Ukrainian sources, uh, first of all, they use different terminology for what they call these people. Ukrainian uh, sources almost inevitably uh, refer to the rebels as uh, terroristi, uh, and uh, which is to say terrorists, and they overwhelmingly focus on uh, indiscriminate shelling. Um, which has been machine translated into fire uh, shell, but uh, this is means uh, um, which is, is a term that, that's used for artillery shelling and rocket shelling. Um, now, um, it's quite a different picture on on the in how it codes government events. Um, so Ukrainian media mainly focus on selective detentions by state security services. They do not focus on artillery shelling and in, indiscriminate in uh, uses of force. Um, so, so, so here we have, um, so by the way, this is a word cloud in which uh, the, the, the size of the font uh, is proportional to uh, uh, the term frequency uh, of, of, each, of each word within the set of documents that's classified as government attack, in this case as, as rebel attack. Um, so if you were to believe Ukrainian sources, uh, it looks like uh, rebels are almost exclusively used in discriminative force. Uh, Pretty much every shelling incident that is reported is one that's by, done by the rebels. Um, meanwhile, uh, the government is just simply s sitting there quietly arresting people that they believe to be terrorists, uh, not doing any discriminate shelling whatsoever. Um, 
the Russian sources have the complete opposite bias. Uh, so they focus on um, basically uh, Ukrainian troops shelling. Uh, these are the government reports. Uh, uh, while, uh, first of all, the rebels are referred to as militia or insurgents rather than terrorists. And mainly they focus on either capture of territory uh, and, uh, and, and uh, selective detentions. And so uh, basically each set of documents is only telling you part of the story. Uh, Ukrainian media under reports shelling by, uh, by Ukrainian forces, under reports arrests and the like by, by, rebel, by, uh, by rebel forces. Russian media did the complete opposite. Um, the huge reporting biases on each side. And, and actually, the Russian sources are nowhere near as bad as the rebel ones. Uh, uh, actually, the rebel ones, in, in a way, they're a little, a little more honest in that w when there's a shelling incident by, by rebels, Russians, Russian sources generally use the passive voice like a shelling incident took place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who did it? Who knows? <laughs> um, whereas whereas uh, rebel sources usually say something along the lines of, uh, we were forced to return fire after being shelled by, by, government, by government forces. Um, and, but, but except they don't call them government forces, they call them Nazis, fascists. Uh, my personal favorite is Ukro Wehrmacht. Um, they're pretty creative, these guys. Um, so in that, I guess on that spectrum, Russian sources are actually pretty balanced. Um, but, um, but that's a challenge. Um, so the way I aggregated these data up, um, so I have you know, a census of all the populated places within these two provinces, about 3,000 of them. Um, for each of these, or every single day, I looked at um, whether each of these sources uh, reported an event of each type having taken place in that village on that day. Um, in the case where there are multiple events of the same type reported in the same day, I used a, a one-a-day filter, which is basically used to, uh, it's used in the text analysis community to filter out uh, you know, double counts uh, of course, it also discounts uh, places where there's a very high intensity of violence. But if you aggregate up to the weekly level, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, where, where the, the concentration of, uh, of violence is because uh, you'll see multiple events on multiple days in a row. Um, and um, so let me show you what this looks like over time. This is aggregated to the weekly level. So, so basically no violence up until uh, uh, <coughs> April and then had a terrorist operation begins. Reaches its climax around uh, July, uh, July and August, and then there's a ceasefire, which, as you can see here, didn't really, didn't really hold. Um, and then there was an, another uh, conflagration in, uh, in in January, uh, right there, and that's those are some of the last events in our, in our data set uh, that happened after the second Minsk Agreement. Uh, Yeah, well, it's uh, the ceasefire is not a peace agreement, um, and it's you know it's written so broadly that uh, any side can be can claim in good faith to be abiding by it uh, while claiming that the other is in violation. Um, but uh, so that's so that's the violence data. Um, then I also want to take a look at a different outcome, which is territorial control, um, and um, and here uh, we glean these of. These data from several uh, additional sources, which is uh, so basically red here means uh, rebel control, blue means uh, government control, and these are transparency. So in places that spent part of the time, uh, basically from from last March to the present, uh, under rebel and then under government control, it was purplish. Um, so these are from a couple different sources, basically from georeferenced daily maps that were released first of all by Ukraine's uh, <coughs> National Security Council. Um, and which are great. I mean, I'm not familiar with any other uh, other topic where the government is so transparent about uh, saying what parts of the country it controls, what parts it doesn't. Um, that said, um, Ukraine's uh, uh, Ukraine's official representatives tend to underreport territory that they've lost, or at least there's a time lag. Usually, it takes about a week, like between when they lost a village and when they reported as being under DNR control. Um, so then, I also uh, combine these with. Uh, maps produced by pro-rebel bloggers, which have a bias in the opposite direction, but actually there's a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty strong correlation between them. Um, and so what, uh, what my research team uh, has done is um, they pretty much every daily map, uh, they're geo-referenced it, they created polygons to basically tell us what, uh, what part of the country is controlled by whom. Um, and then um, 
but these maps uh, that, that the government and the, and the Robo bloggers have produced only go back to about like mid mid June. Uh, for the time period before that, I have to rely on you know, Facebook posts on rebel checkpoint locations, uh, which essentially started um, basically when the rebels started taking territory in the, in April. Um, and whenever there's a new, you know, you, you, you're, you're driving home and all of a sudden there's a guy there with an assault rifle asking for your documents. Uh, that seems interesting. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll post that to my Facebook account. Uh, so we scraped that. Um, and then, um, and, and so basically what I did for the period before June is I looked at the convex hull of these, uh, of, 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 these, uh, of these data points and these are updated, we know, on a daily basis then to see the, the extent of rebel control. Now, um, so let me give you, uh, again, an overview of the dynamics of the conflict. Again, rebels not really taking much territory before April, uh, when town by town they start you know, taking control of government buildings. And then the real change happens on, on May 11th after the referendum when they completely seize control of a large chunk of this province. And, the, and this territory basically stays static up until you know, late, late June, uh, then July, when uh, the Ukrainian army is on the offensive. And then for a while, it looks like the rebels are about to lose um, until late August when there was a Russian incursion. Uh, right there, there you go. Um, you know, problem solved. Um, they're taking large chunks of territory. And then there was a ceasefire agreement after which, uh, you know, there was still a lot of territory being shifted, but the line remained relatively static with the exception of this pocket around the Baltzava, uh, critical rail junction, extremely vulnerable position if you think about it from the Ukrainian side. So on a few sides by rebels. Uh, there was also some fighting around the airport here. Uh, you know, there's been a few towns changing, changing control here and there. Then eventually, you know, the pocket was closed, and that's the distribution of control that is currently, uh, currently on the ground. Um, so this gives us daily, daily data on who controls what village, um, and um, so that's the de that's the dependent variable. Um, Let's uh, look at uh, explanatory variables. Well, first of all, uh, there's local economic conditions. Uh, where I have data on about half a million uh, enterprises in Donetsk and Luhansk at the village level. Um, basically, here's, here it is broken down by sector. Uh, extractive and cultural is in green. Uh, manufacturing is in blue. Uh, then services is in orange. Um, and I got this from the Orbis. Uh, database and essentially looked at the proportion of uh, the labor force in each village that's employed in each industry. Um, and so here, um, here it is broken down by our three big three industries, machinery, mining, and metallurgy, and blue, green, and red. Um, not a lot of industrial labor up here. This is, as you see, mostly service-oriented service, service -oriented economy. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of variation. Um, um, you know, a lot of the metallurgy is concentrated around Mariupol and, uh, and up here. Um, you know, and I have, uh, there you go, there's the three industries. Um, and then I have data on the local Russian population uh, from the Ukrainian census uh, 2002, I mean 2001. Um, and this is just a map of uh, ethnic majority status, uh, whether Ukrainians or Russians uh, majority in each or whether it's mixed. A uh, large portion of the of local population is mixed ethnically. A very different map, by the way, if you look at Russian language. Um, so, um, like I said, a majority of ethnic Ukrainians in this part of the country do not speak Ukrainian at home. Um, so even places where Russians may not live, uh, from the standpoint of the ethnic balance, people there speak Ukrainian. Uh, and by the way, the blue here is, uh, is actually not Ukraine, but other, they're actually significant uh, concentration of Greek speakers around Mariupol, uh, traditionally, uh, historically a, a Greek port, uh, and then a few pockets of them over here. Uh, so that's, that's the, my measure of the local Russian population. I also had data on, uh, from the old Soviet uh, Atlas Narodov Mira, which is uh, you know, used as the basis for you know, the measure of ethnic fractionalization that many of us use, um, but that one's from the 60s. Uh, anyway, the, the, same, the same result holds. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, then I also had data on the military geography, elevation, forests, distance to road, distance to the Russian border. This right here is a picture from Selwyn Margila, 
which is a strategic height um, in the Donbass, a great artillery position. Um, and the idea there is uh, you know, good spots like that will be contested more fiercely. Um, and I also have village level data on, uh, well, actually, this is district level data, I shouldn't lie, on the, per on the percent of vote that Yanukovych received in uh, 2010. Um, then I have standard demographic controls on population density, and then I uh, also look at spillovers from neighboring towns um, and temporal dependence with the balance on previous days and weeks predicts balance today. Um, so, a lot of variables here, uh, a lot of potential drivers of conflict, and at, and at this stage, uh, by the way, this is still like the beta version of the data, <coughs> still being updated on a, a weekly basis, and my analysis of these data so far have been mostly exploratory, and, uh, and the main interest uh, that I have in this particular lecture and in this paper is to kind of arbitrate between these two main explanations of the violence, right, uh, economics and identity, and I do that with... Um, Bayesian model averaging, um, where there's some uncertainty over the true theory of violence, um, which of these uh, uh, umpteen uh, variables predicts uh, variation in, uh, in, in the intensity of violence and the duration of violence the best. Um, and basically what I'm trying to do here is uh, basically computing the posterior probability over models with all possible combinations of these explanatory variables, right? Uh, so I fit every possible model I see which of them is most likely given the data. Um, then I constructed a weighted average uh, over these, uh, these vacuum models to uh, derive this, uh, this quantity of interest, which is the uh, model weighted posterior distribution for the coefficients, which is simply, uh, so this the posterior distribution of beta given the data, uh, which is a weighted average of, uh, of the posterior distribution of, of the coefficients within each model, weighted by uh, <coughs> weighted by the posterior probability of that model. Um, so this is, um, and the model itself, you know, can take the form of a standard GLM, and I'll talk about the specific uh, functional performance that I used in a moment. Uh, then the model weights themselves are just ba based on the posterior model probabilities here, uh, where uh, this is the marginal likelihood of the model, that's, that's the, and that uh, right there is the model prior. Um, anyway, um, don't need to worry about this too much. Uh, it's just uh, for those who are interested in what's going on under the hood. Um, in terms of the actual mo model space that I'm going to run this algorithm over. Uh, first, I'm interested in the intensity of rebel violence in a given village in a given week. Um, and f for that, I have a spatial out aggressive GLM with a quasi Poisson link to account for over dispersion in the event counts. Um, and, um, and I also look at both the village week level and uh, the village level. Um, and I look at um, also a series of duration models. I look at the duration until the first rebel attack, um, dura duration under the first uh, assertion of rebel control in a, in a village, and the duration until that village under rebel control was liberated by Kiev. How long uh, does a village stay under rebel control? What predicts that? Um, and are the, are the determinants of rebel control different from the determinants of violence? Um, so, in terms of the priors, uh, I have a uniform distribution of the model priors and BIC uh, approximation for the occlusion probability priors for each coefficient. Which only, the only thing you need to consider here is that basically uh, all models have basically an equal probability of being correct a priori. Um, that's I'm not um, privileging any model over the other. Basically, completely uninformative prior. Let's see what sticks. Um, so. Here's a, here are the model weighted posterior distributions of my coefficients. Uh, so each dot here is a draw from the posterior distribution of that, uh, of that coefficient. And the transparency here uh, reflecting the, um, uh, the, the uh, inclusion, uh, posterior inclusion probability. Uh, so basically the model, uh, the coefficients here that you see are just being invisible means they are not very strong predictors of the intensity of rebel violence at all. Um, they do not explain the variation in a dependent variable. Uh, and they say, bottom line, violence is higher where the proportion of the population employed in industries dependent on Russia is higher. Uh, so the higher the proportion employed in the machinery industry, the more rebel attacks there will be in a village week. Right? Blue lines here <laughs> are the 95% um, credible intervals. Um, and so basically this is just a lot of simu simulated values. Um, now, 
proportion of ethnic Russians also has a positive effect, right? Uh, but it's much smaller. Um, and if we look at that, you know, the, the credible interval is a little bit wider, the slope is a little bit flatter, the effect is much smaller. Um, Russian language has no effect. Um, see, um, flat line. Um, living in a Russian-speaking town does not predict whether uh, a high intensity of violence will occur there. Um, and so the strongest predictor here appears to be economic. Uh, and this is even more stark if you apply collapse of time dimension. If I just look at the intensity of violence over the full duration of the conflict uh, at the village level, here the, the ethnic variables simply drop out. Um, basically, the only thing that remains, yeah, the proportion employed in the machine building industry, uh, the distance to road. So the farther away you are from a major road, the harder it is for the rebels to access you. Um, and a population density, you know, there will be more attacks where a lot of people live. Yeah. So, so that's the intensity of violence. Um, now let's look at the, some of the duration models. So first let's look at the first rebel attack. What's the, the experience of, exp what's the probability of experiencing a rebel attack given that your village has been peaceful since 2010? Um, so that probability um, is four times higher in villages dominated by the, by the machine industry relative to ones where the uh, machine industry is negligible. Um, so the um, local Russian ethnic balance does not predict uh, how soon you <coughs> will experience horrible violence. Um, Rebels are also 90 times more likely to take control in villages dominated by the machine, machine building industry. Um, if you live in a village that's dominated by the machine industry, uh, there's a very high probability that on any given day, you're going to fall under rebel control. Um, meanwhile, the same hazard ratio for ethnic Russian villages is just two and a half. Um, so, much stronger effect there. Um, so, but, but what, uh, what economics does not predict uh, as well is the probability or, or, the, or the hazard uh, ratio of being liberated by Ukraine. Um, so, uh, if you live in a majority Russian uh, ethnic uh, village, you're much more, uh, it's going to take much longer for you to be liberated by Kiev. Um, and um, so, I haven't, I haven't completely sorted through the logic of that, to be honest. I, th I think part of that might be that. Um, just uh, once the conflict erupted, there was this wave of, uh, of, of Russian nationalist volunteers flowing in. It was probably much easier for them to operate uh, with a majority of Russian, uh, majority of Russian villages. Uh, well, I mean, there's also a you know, negative hazard ratio for the mining industry. Um, but overall, uh, the bottom line is this. So economic shocks explain the initial outbreak of the rebellion. They explain the establishment of rebel control they explain the intensity of violence. Um, at the very least, they explain these things better uh, than the uh, than, than uh, language ethnicity. Um, <coughs> Russian nationalism is a much stronger predictor of maintaining rebel control. Right? And so um, well, these, these different outcomes have slightly different predictors, as you, as you see here. Um, of course, um, the overall story here is, is tragic. Right? I mean, it's, uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, I mean, the costs of the war have been tremendous. I mean, there, by the conservative UN estimates, over 6,000 people have been killed, uh, 80 to 90 percent of them being civilians, being killed by artillery fire. Um, and, uh, and by the way, this conservative estimates, they do not count the people who are buried in their own backyard. It's just what makes it into the morgue since it's been reported to uh, international organizations. Uh, and, you know, if you watch documentary footage from that region, uh, it's pretty, pretty hard to go through more than a couple minutes of that, of that footage without seeing a dead body. Um, and those dead bodies that you see in, the, in those documentaries on Vice News, uh, you know, on, uh, on, on BBC and elsewhere, uh, are not part of that 6,000. Uh, so the real number is probably much higher, and the um, number of displaced is well over a million, uh, about half and half to Russia, half to Ukraine. Um, of course, if you if you uh, if you're displaced to Ukraine, if you run from this conflict zone to territories under control of Kiev, uh, there of course is the the risk of uh, you know being mobilized to fight against the rebels. Um, so that's why a lot of people then flee to Russia. Um, but in terms of the so that's the that's the human cost. 
next to which the economic cost seems, seems trivial. So let's look at that as well. Um, so industrial production uh, in the Donbass has been down 50%, um, which is, say, twofold. Um, a lot of that is well, machine building exports to Russia is down 82%. Um, rebelling has not helped this industry, to put it mildly. Um, a lot of this because the factories have been destroyed by artillery fire. Um, a lot of it by Ukrainian troops who are trying to prevent rebels from taking control of these factories, from being able to make a profit out of them. Uh, others sh are just shelled uh, by air. Um, although, although Ukrainian artillery has actually been doing a pretty good job of, of avoiding, uh, avoiding coal mines, but a lot of factories have been uh, thoroughly destroyed. Um, Coal mines in this region are essentially ground to a halt. I mean, uh, over 60% of uh, the coal mining industry of Ukraine um, is now under rebel control. And they're actually selling a lot of that coal to, uh, to Ukraine proper right now. Uh, but a lot of the, the mines have been flooded. A lot of them have been looted. Uh, a lot of them have been taken over by rebels. Uh, a lot of the factories have been shut down and taken over by rebels, including this past week, the main locomotive plant in Donetsk has been forced to shut down by rebels. Um, so um, then logistical transportation infrastructure has been destroyed. You probably have all seen what happened to the airport. Um, nothing is flying out of there anytime soon. Uh, railroad network is completely destroyed. Uh, the port in Mariupol is only, uh, I think it's like 50% operational right now. So even if they could produce it, they can't export much. Uh, and there's been a lot of looting and raiding by both sides, um, um, both by the rebels and by a lot of these, uh, these private militias fighting on, on the Ukrainian side, particularly ones that are under the control of Igor Kolomoisky, um, who have been uh, intently preventing uh, a lot of the, uh, the coal from leaving the, uh, le leaving the rebel-controlled territories, uh, raiding factories owned by his uh, economic rivals. Um, but. It, now, the bottom line, this is not a story about, you know, uh, this, the salvation of the industrial heartland of Ukraine. This is a story about the deindustrialization of Donbass. Uh, what this conflict has done is it, it has turned uh, Donbass from the most highly industrialized part of Ukraine, most highly industrialized part of the Soviet Union, into a pre-industrial, post-apocalyptic wasteland. This is a tragedy. And, of course, this then raises the question, if that's, if that's what conflict results in why did they rebel in the first place? Surely any amount of damage that they would have received from the, from the CEU association agreement um, nowhere near matches the amount of destruction that we've seen in, <coughs> in, recent, in recent months. Well, that's, I mean, that's the efficiency puzzle of war. I mean, um, in hindsight, they probably would have reconsidered. Uh, but, that's, but this also wasn't part of their choice set originally, right? They're, they were not choosing between this and, and the, in the EU agreement. They were choosing between you know, some probability of keeping their jobs, some probability of getting some regional autonomy some, uh, to be able to trade with Russia to uh, keep, their, keep their jobs uh, versus uh, joining this EU association agreement. But uh, what's happened there is utterly heartbreaking. And um, you know, there's no, I wish I could end on a happier note, but um, unfortunately, this, this will keep going. Um, so. On that happy note, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, turn it over to you uh, for, for Q&A. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. Most of the ones I talked to were firmly pro-Ukrainian in this regard, that they thought that 
the insurgent propaganda disorder. Um, the same is true of my uh, people I talked to in Kharkiv. Um, Kharkiv, of course, was not invaded, but the idea was that they were afraid. Uh, they were afraid of an invasion, and they were. And the way they talked about it did not communicate that they feel like they have any agency over it. Um, and you know, even if that agency involves picking up arms, what percentage of the population can really effectively be able to pick up arms? You know. Um, so my question is whether this. Uh, and you know, it, sorry, just to make one more example is, uh, for example, the Crimean Tartars, which we all know were quite strongly opposed to the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Um, you know, their opposition did nothing to slow the Russian advance, and you know, now you uh, slow the Russian annexation. So now you have Crimean Tartar villages under the control of Russia. And if you were to make a similar map about Russian troops, those villages would be just as under the control of Russia as Sevastopol is in Europa. Um, so my question is, how much agency do you, how much agency can we really ascribe to the average civilian in this, uh, or to the average resident of the Donbass? And thank you very much for your yeah, time, by the way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a terrific question, and uh, I think about the same amount of agency that we would give to the median civilian in Aleppo, the median civilian in Mosul, right? It's, uh, I mean, I mean, there's very little you can do if there are armed men on the street, uh, you know, walking with assault rifles, much less in a BTR. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, the way this usually manifests itself, this local agency, is in the support that this locals provide to the rebels, uh, providing them shelter, providing them uh, with food, um, not actively resisting them. I, I think the main agency that they have is to leave. Uh, thereby denying uh, denying the, these armed men of the local base of support, denying them of the supplies. Uh, but I would add, however, that I mean, in the shelling patterns by the Ukrainian government, there is an implicit assumption that these civilians have some agency to keep these people out, which I don't think is necessarily valid. So, for instance, the typical pattern is: uh, so, why does Donetsk get shelled? Uh, why do residential neighborhoods in Donetsk get shelled? It's not because the Ukrainian army is doing it fun, it's because rebels are shelling Ukrainian government positions from residential neighborhoods in the same way that, you know, Pal uh, Hamas is firing rockets out of Gaza. Then, you know, they, it's truck mounted artillery. After the, sh the shells have been fired, they drive off somewhere else. Then three hours later, you know, the, there's artillery shells from the Ukrainian side that, sh that hit that particular ta part of town. The Ukrainian government knows that the rebels have left by now. Uh, why is it doing this? Well, I mean, it's... Presumably, it's coercive, right? It's to teach them a lesson. Um, don't let this happen in, in your neighborhood. Um, and in terms of how much agency they have to let these people out, limited. Uh, the people who support them join them. Uh, the people who don't leave. Um, and I think that's I think that that's the same story no matter where you look, whether it's Ukraine or anywhere else. Yeah. Right. So I want to ask sort of a related question. I think this is the agency. So one Ooh. thing. One could be that in areas with a lot of industrialization or like Kazakhstan, you know, inefficient and non-competitive, there's just an excess population from industrialized workers who are unemployed and dependent. Mm -hmm. And so you see the, the, the violence happening because there's that concentration of population. And it's not just kind of economic resistance that you have there. The other thing, and it would still look the same, but the other and the other alternative is that these people are being it's a successful agency, these people are being directed by Russia or Putin somehow mm. to take locations that seem to have high value. Mm. Although, as you point out, they no longer have that mm. value. Mm. Um, so I just wonder if there's, I mean, I know you said this is preliminary, so there's probably not anything right now, but how can we parse out, is it really economic resistance when there are some moments of population? Yeah. Yeah, so I, so, so I think, um, yeah, so, th so there are a couple parts to this question, right? So the. So, so first is, is the labor force, whether in, in a place where such, there's such an inefficient uh, industrial production, whether there's kind of uh, swarms of, you know, combat-ready young men. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, in Donetsk and Luhansk has the largest uh, labor force by, in absolute numbers and as a proportion of the overall population. And actually has, uh, you know, has historically had uh, one, one of the highest rates of employment uh, in, in, in all of Ukraine. Um, and, but essentially what has happened is, as the conflict go, uh, has gone on, basically these are factory towns where you have one factory that employs 15,000 people. Factory gets shut down by fighting. Where are those people gonna go? Um, 
well, and that's kind of that opportunity cost story now. The opportunity cost of, of soldiering has gone down. Um, and, um, and in terms of the strategic value of, of these locations to Russia, negligible. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I, I don't think this is a story of, uh, you, know, the, you know, the spoils of war and, and a contest over resources between Russia and Ukraine. I think uh, it's more of a story of what parts of the population are more susceptible, if you will, to Russian propaganda. Uh, more receptive to, uh, to, 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 to Russian news, to, uh, to the Russian narrative of you know, Kiev being now dominated by a national junta. Um, and um, yeah, but uh, it, I mean, in terms of the value of these industrial objects, Russia has hedged their bets a long time ago. They're, uh, and they, I mean, it's the last thing they want is, um, from their standpoint, uh, a backwards, uh, an economically backwards, a ruined piece of territory. Yes, sir. No, I thought the last question was spot on. There was some evidence that it could be the latter, not the former. There was even evidence by the, um, the removal of entire industries out of some of these more <coughs> rebellious areas in early parts of the war. It certainly seems that uh, these are high impact targets, the high, highly profitable targets of the rebellion. But of course, my question was going to that. The other thing I'd like to just mention is that it's actually you've shown through maps. From the south, uh, Dnipro Petrovsk and uh, Zaporozhye. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think, um, well, the, I mean, I mean the, that's, that's kind of what you would expect in a, in, in, in a place that's on the border of a war zone, right? They, that, that's, that's where a lot of the frontline units ha have their headquarters. Uh, particularly in, in Zaporozhye uh, the, and, and Dnipro Petrovsk, well, first of all, there, there's a privately funded militias. Um, the, by Igor Kolomoisky and other oligarchs uh, that, um, that was essentially held the bulwark. They see, among other things, they see themselves as the only thing keeping Russia from taking over large swaths of Ukraine. Um, and, um, and indeed, there, there have been a lot of you know, recent uh, surveys done in Ukraine that show that uh, public attitudes toward Putin, toward the rebels in, in Zaporozhye and in, in Nikolaev and, and, and uh, this whole swath of territory called uh, Nova Russia uh, in, 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 in Russian propaganda. Op opposition to Russia is very high. Um, that said, um, there's been a campaign underway, uh, you know, terrorist campaign, a partisan campaign. Uh, every, every couple of weeks there's an explosion that happens in, in Kharkiv and in, uh, in Odessa. Um, and so there is, there is some underground resistance there because these, are, these have been hotbeds of, of the pro-Russian protests a year ago. Uh, that somehow did not escalate, but those people didn't go anywhere. Uh, a lot of them still live there, um, and they've essentially gone underground. I mean, I, I, I don't know if that, that really gets at your question, but uh, it's, uh, um, yeah, you, it's. Yeah, and, and, and that's and that's exactly the kind of violence that you would use if you have no local base of support. Exactly. Um, that said, I, I think um, public attitudes toward the rebels is a very fickle thing. Uh, if you look at uh, the villages that have been liberated by, by Kiev, uh, or towns like Kramatorsk or, or, or Slavinsk, um, and if you look at reporting from the ground, uh, there's great, great footage uh, by Vice News in, uh, in, in, in Slavinsk in early July after they've been liberated, uh, where, um, where there, there are all these people flooding the square uh, greeting the Ukrainian troops as liberators, and, and, and then the reporter goes up to one of them, so how do you feel? Uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of support for the Ukrainian government here. It's like, oh, that one right there? She, she used to host three rebels in her house last week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these, these things flip depending on, you know, who, uh, you know, who holds the threat of death over you. Um, but that said, I, you're absolutely right. That is what the opinion polls show. Um, yeah. So actually, a lot of it has been uh, exported, not, not, not even so much to Russia, but to other parts of Ukraine. A lot of the companies have moved their headquarters to Ukraine proper. Uh, in terms of the, the industries themselves, uh, and it's not so much 
export as, you know, import substitution. Uh, you know, we used to, we used to import uh, these helicopter engines from, U from Ukraine. Now we'll produce them domestically. Um, the labor force f for them is, is Russian. These aren't... Uh, Well, some of these industries are more mobile than others, right? You can't you can't move a coal mine, uh, and you can't you can't move. A, I mean, these these are heavy industrial plants. Uh, yeah, they were misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, so oh, okay, 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 okay. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, yeah, I mean that's a. Uh, that is happening. I, th I think. I think it's still happening on the on the margins. That's. Uh, I mean that you can't. Uh, there's way too much uh, heavy machinery to be moved wholesale. This isn't like World War II and the and the wholesale moving of factories to the other side of the Urals. Uh, th I mean. Uh, I mean, how widespread is this? I mean, that you. Well, this factory is particularly high profile because it was a military factory. Mm -hmm. um, um, the idea, though, but what's interesting about it, though, is that it was taken by the separatists and moved to Russia. I mean, it was essentially mm -hmm. looted, right? This is the mm -hmm. Ukrainian government operation, mm -hmm. or Ukrainian mm -hmm. yeah. government mm -hmm. subsidiary operated this factory that was picked up, not damaged, I mean, and the machinery was moved. So mm -hmm. this, I think the two things, this is indicative of a activity, a strategic military target, and, lo and looting is, um, mm -hmm. uh, so basically it is a strategic objective, not yeah. just one, uh, that may, I mean, I'm not saying that this one factory is going to make or break the Russian economy, but it is not of uh, if it's worth moving, it's probably not of insignificant value to Russia mm. strategically. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I, I need to look into that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so you've been very patient. Yeah, so, um, well, there was a, um, if, you're, if you're referring to Novozovsk yeah. in the south, that used to be under rebel control un until, uh, Jil until June uh, 20, uh, 2014. Um, so, I mean, in terms of regular Russian troops supporting the, the rebels, that happened mainly in, in August, uh, late August, and that was really the only major influx of Russian troops for the <coughs> most part. Uh, I mean, the public face of, of the uh, of the insurgency is is local and Russian volunteers. They're the ones manning the checkpoints. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to have Russian special forces, you know, controlling a roadblock. Um, but um, yeah, so so right here is what he, what he was referring to. Um, so this this part of Ukraine and Mariupol used to be under rebel control until Ukraine. This kind of flipped. Uh, but then. Basically, after after this Russian incursion, the Russians pulled back. Right, um, right now they're mainly uh, providing logistical support, intelligence support. They're flying the drones. They're not on the front lines, uh, physically holding these towns. Uh, so, so certainly that was uh, that that blip in a uh, in August is uh, a slightly different story from locals rising up and taking over a town. Uh, but that in and of itself doesn't explain why they were able to hold that territory. Um, I mean, there are other part. There are other territories that they have lost. Actually, right, right around there, uh, close, close to Mariupol, it was essentially a neutral strip. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a hard empirical di to disentangle uh, which villages were taken over by whom. We don't have data of, the, of, of that that fine grained, uh, at least not not with that heavy dose of uncertainty. Uh, yeah, Mel.
if you look ahead to what might be a kind of settlement, um, it could be prospects. If you look at it from a direction standpoint, it could be kind of like there's an economic argument there in terms of what they have to pick up and fix. You look at the economics of that, it's a, it's a drain on the rest of the country. But from the standpoint of a, uh, of a, of a settlement, what is sort of good war in after one to ever comes out of it, let's say it is, um, why couldn't a more economically based settlement be drawn up that might actually work along with some of the other kinds of this area that I spoke a lot about time is before and uh, And if you look at the mint, you know, the, the various different mints to do, if that was loaded up more on the economic side, uh, would that kind of, if I try to extract mm. something out of the research here, it seems to me I would say, um, well, let's make this much more economically uh, attractive in a way. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that aspect? Yeah, I'm thinking about is there going to be some kind of way to settle this short of a full military victory on the side of the other? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think one of the problems with reaching a long-term settlement is the well, part of it is the sequence of actions that need to take place, right? Uh, so the so the rebels want constitutional reform, uh, giving these regions special status, special autonomous status, and then holding local elections. The Ukrainian government insists on holding elections first, and then you know, we'll talk about the final status. Um, and then there's the, but on the economic front right now, I think the main sticking point is who's going to pay for all this? Who's going to pay for the for the destruction? And on that, on that front, the official position of the Ukrainian government, as articulated by Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, is Russia's got to pay for this. Um, and from the Russian standpoint, okay, so you want us to pay for the factories and towns that you destroyed with your own artillery. Um, yeah, so, they, I mean, there's not a lot of bargaining space there, right? The problem. And then it's not clear uh, you know, international sources are funding. But I think right, right now, uh, the question of economic autonomy, uh, spe special trade relations with Russia, I think that right now that's fallen to the background. Uh, first, let's, let, let's figure out what status these regions are going to have within Ukraine. But in a, in a way, also, the, I mean, the demands of the rebels haven't changed since 1994, right? It's, uh, they want local autonomy, uh, particularly on the economic side, language rights, economic union with Russia. Um, and I, I don't think anyone's even... In some ways, the rebel demands have decreased from what they were about a year ago. No one's really calling for outright independence anymore. Uh, they, they will be content with, with autonomy. One of the problems is federalization of Ukraine is an idea that Russia has been pushing. So it's not so much a problem with the idea itself. It's the, it's the messenger. It's who's proposing it. And any, any idea, no matter what its merits are, whether it's decentralization or federalization, whatever you call it, if it's what Russia wants, if it's what Russia recommends, it's probably not what Ukraine will accept. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's just how it is. Um, yeah, Ron. Two questions. Mm -hmm. One from the inside talk and one outside. Um, inside talk, how would you, how would you evaluate using or not without? That is, would it be the presence of Ukrainian security forces? Mm -hmm. Because there were these moments of, of rebellion or protest, like the Odessa moment where people were burned in that. Mm -hmm. uh, October. Uh, so is that one thing? And outside the talk, your story is very compelling. I like it very much. But it's different from the Putin story. That is, the reason for Putin to support this area is not about economics, I, I would imagine, by this point, but it's about geopolitics and the idea of what the West will do after an association uh, and maybe his somewhat exaggerated or even paranoid ideas about NATO coming. Those are two different questions. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, in, in a way, you know, defending the Russian world is a better bumper sticker than you know, you know, local economic autonomy for, for, for these regions. But in a way, I, I think uh, he doesn't really care about the latter. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, he, he cares about, you know, keeping, you know, you know, Ukraine tethered so they can't join NATO, they can't join the EU. Uh, so they have this uh, ongoing frozen conflict within it that basically extending NATO membership to them would be akin to, you know, selling insurance on a burning house. Um, but um, yeah, but but that in and of itself, um, that's also like the main motivation behind yeah, this research project. Because Putin's uh, objectives lie well beyond Donbass. So Donbass is basically where he 
uh, where he was able to implement this plan. I mean, but this doesn't explain in of itself why Kharkiv didn't why Kharkiv didn't rise up, why Odessa didn't rise up. Uh, for a while, it looked like they were going to. Um, in terms of reasons re reasons for not rebelling, uh, what was different about Kharkiv and Odessa? Ukrainian SBU cracked down right away, arresting dozens of activists. Uh, basically going uh, and using force uh, almost immediately uh, to, uh, to, clear the, to clear the government buildings. Um, and, I th and I think what, what determines, uh, you know, probability of rebelling, first of all, is whether uh, there's, someone, uh, there's someone in place to hold the threat of death over you, to, to basically to arrest you if you, jo if you join the other side. Um, but, I mean, wh what I'm doing here is, um, I mean, the, the, the difference between that and looking at economic profile and the ethnic profile is these things took shape before the conflict started. Uh, the existence of local security forces and their activities are endogenous to the conflict. I mean, they're, they're likely to, uh, SBU is likely to make arrests where they think there's a high probability of this, of this region falling to rebel hands. Um, but basically, economic profile, uh, the, this industrial picture that I was telling you about, basically tells you about, like, what is the baseline probability? That, that a given village is going to fall under, or under rebel or uh, or government control. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the motivation there. Right? Yes, ma'am. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, <laughs> team, uh, get on that right away. Um, no, so, so uh, yeah, I mean the way I, do, I, I control for it now is with a proxy, basically distance to the Russian border, which I hope captures, uh, well, uh, well, the, the, the extent to which you know these arms and shipments will be readily available. Uh, but I, I agree they're an indirect measure. Part of the problem is there's no reliable source on the on these weapons, uh, on, on the weapons source, because the Ukraine FB will say like, oh, another million Russian trucks just <laughs> crossed the border. And NATO is like, nah, well, not quite a million. It's more like a thousand. But in in the satellite imagery, but yeah, that's that's a great idea. That's definitely something we should we should try to try to capture. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Mm -hmm.